It's a special day. Uh, would you please go with me to 2 Kings chapter 6? We will read from verse 1 to 7. 2 Kings 6, 1 to 7. Uh, it's a very, very popular uh, pericope in the Bible, uh, a section that has been taught in Sunday school. We have heard tons and tons of preachings around the sons of the prophet and Elisha. But because it's the word of God, you can still glean and find extra wisdom of things that you never knew. Or if you knew everything, at least it's a, it's a good reminder. So let's be open in learning today. Now, I was greatly surprised in the best way possible by the early service because the reading was spot on and, and very enthusiastic. So I want us to join again in reading together as, as a congregation. One, two, three. Now, I want to talk on a subject fit, <clears throat> excuse me, fit for purpose. That's that a subject matter today. <clears throat> fit for purpose. And uh, it's the old tension that does exist again and again between what we all dream of growth and progress. Growth and, pro uh, growth and progress, it's a very, very uh, attractive thing to all sorts of people, younger, older, families, companies, organization. We want to grow. We want to see progress. But as growth and progress comes, then it puts a demand on all of us for two things that are very, very hard to achieve. To adapt is the number one thing, and to adjust. These are things that are very difficult. On one side, there's something that is very attractive, very uh, important, growth and progress. But on the other side, there's a responsibility that comes with growth and progress, which is the need to adapt and to adjust. I was alluding to Friday. Friday, uh, on Thursday already, my mom, <clears throat> start being excited and I couldn't not understand what's the excitement about and goes, Zach is coming. <laughs> and I go, the little guy doesn't even know that he's coming. You know, why, why would you go out of your way? You know, they're coming on Friday, they will visit and I go, okay, that's fine. But because of the, you know, condition I was, so I could not match the excitement. Uh, I just knew the guy was coming. And then my, to my surprise, when the little guy came, it is not the same guy I saw the last time. He has grown. Now I begin to think. We are all very happy that our grandchild is growing. But there's a problem with the growth of this tiny little guy. A month ago or so, before he was born, people got super excited. And then you could see the video that happened on that Sunday, I'm not mentioning, <laughs> of, of people going crazy around you. And uh, I was watching from my hotel room and I went, Lord, deliver my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so it was auntie, it was uncle, it was friend, it was this, it was that, it was grandma, went over the top, it was parents themselves. 
and the boats way too many clothes that one guy can wear to spoil the little guy. But the trouble with babies is babies grow quickly and they outgrow clothes. A parent has only two choices. To pray that the baby doesn't grow <laughs> so that we don't waste money we spend in this or to be prepared that we will lose the money for the sake of the growth. Now, what applies to natural birth and growth applies to organizations. We can keep the same method, same approach, same things that you did because it fitted there. Then we start the growth of the organization because that's where we feel comfortable. Or we can say, let's allow this thing to grow and develop as it does. Then it requires to spend more, do things in a different manner. That's the tension you will always live with, with growth and expansion and development on one side and the other side is adjustment and uh, adaptation. That's the story that you're reading. The reason why it's so beautiful is these sons of prophets. You know, we don't have time because we have uh, more important things to do today. But you can, you can literally go in seven or six avenues to deal with this conundrum. It's, it's, it's a major, major issue that these people are facing. The first guy who had this novel idea of starting a school, a training school where knowledge, uh, skill, understanding is transferred from one generation to the other for amplification purposes, Samuel. Samuel was the first guy to institute education in terms of sons of prophets. How do you hear from God? How do you deliver the message? How do you keep your inner space proper so that when God talks, there's no interference. He does it, and then the school is going well, and uh, then think of what will happen. Uh, Saul, in his crazy state, is chasing David, and then he hears that uh, David have gone to find a hiding place, a trauma where there was a school of prophet. The first school of prophet was a trauma, and then he went and wiped the whole group of student prophet, killed every prophetic guy. Now, when crisis happen, I've taught some crisis two years ago, there are opportunities to adjust. I think the next generation, which was championed by Elijah, he thought, how do we do a better job than the one that our founding father did, Samuel? He created schools of profit, but this time he doesn't create one school. He creates five. Rama, Jericho, you know, name it, different places. So, but if another crazy king attacks one school, actually other prophets will have time to either call fire or run from fire, you know. So, the school goes on, and then Elijah, like any other person, his time is over, he goes, and Elijah takes over. So, the writing and the reading that you do, we did in Second Kings 6, is so rich. You have to read the Bible between the lines. I am sure that Elisha did such a tremendous job that the school that was catering for tiny bunch of student prophets who were interested just kept growing, kept growing, kept growing, kept expanding. And one day, there's a problem. The teaching is the same. The doctrines are the same. Everything is the same. But the comfort is not the same anymore. We used to be okay, now we are cramped. We used to be fine, but now we are squashed. And then what do we do? Sabotage this thing called growth because it takes too much work to do differently or change things altogether. Now, people who teach and preach, you, you can go and expand and, and do a lot of work on this simple 
pericope of, of the Bible. One, the Bible says the primary purpose of the school is to train sons of prophets, not builders. <laughs> so, that can come to where we are. As a church, the primary purpose of church existence is the worship of Almighty God. Now, you can come and argue, and you will be right in your argument, we didn't come to church to build churches. We came to church to worship. You will be right. But you do not be appropriate. So, for the first time, I don't know if it's a class captain, I don't know where the idea came from, but the conversation always in the community starts somewhere. Somebody begin to tell other students something is completely wrong. We cannot be in a tiny little space like this one where the numbers are swelling and then we're in a very precarious position. Can't you go to the master and ask him if we can go and expand the school? And that just sounded very good. So they went and told Elisha, this is the vision we have and the purpose. Can you allow us to, to expand the school? Many things can be drawn from the teaching which time do not permit. But let me put a spin to a current reality. I've been associated with UCT closely since 1995. Literally, you know, I've been a chaplain at SCF for 11 years or 12 uh, before I stopped. So from 95, I was on that campus weekly, basically. And before that, that was my favorite place to, to pray. I'll go to Road Memorial and just spend evenings praying or early in the mornings just to look at the city and pray. So... When you go to upper campus, there was a figure that you will never escape. You know, Henry's and other people, the leaves would be, did the graduation before you go to uh, the main auditorium, Jam Jameson or, or so Hall. You have to pass that guy, and his name is Cecil Road. Cecil overlooked the campus for years. I don't know for how long Cecil has been around, but he has been around for a long, long time. Because in 95, I found him. <laughs> and then the first student movement began. Cecil must fall. Wait a minute. Cecil was around when you came on campus. Why do you want Cecil gone? The engineers, politicians, all sorts of people, big brains in philosophy and other branch of interest who graduated with Cecil on the premise. What's up? That can be a very good argument. We've been worshiping in this church. Ram is 26 years old. You know, what is the use? All we need is to just keep paying the way we do and then multiply services and then we do. Why bother? Exactly as the sons of prophet could think. But these guys, I don't know what happened to them. They just began to go Cecil must go, must fall. And uh, for some reason, I was on campus that day. And I saw a crane coming. And Cecil uprooted for the first time in a long time, never to come back again. And it dawned on me. Every generation is an opportunity to do what no other generation have done before it. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise in the highest place. Yes, Rama might be 26 years. Things might have gone the way they go, but this crop of people, this generation, can do what no other generation in the existence of Rama has ever done. Every time a church rents, is in a precarious situation. Things can go wrong at any time, anyway. Listen, we had two or three guys very emotional 
Because one day they're coming out and then there's this there's board too late. And people thought they're kicking the church out. What's going on? What's going on? That we had to go and calm the people and tell them, no, 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 no. Everything is safe. It's a room that is available inside. Now, do you think if it was ours, anybody will come and put a board? I am pro beauty, big time. If this thing was ours, this church, you were going to leave your house and come live here. Ask my wife. We were going to create some beauty that when you come even before prayer, the demons begin to run away by themselves. <laughs> Just looking at the beauty, so we don't deserve to come in this place. These two columns in my mind should never exist. These two. We should not have a church in this condition. We should have a pulpit that side with a huge balcony right here with offices on top and people in the atrium eating and drinking before coming and then once they're full, they come, they fool themselves in the house of the Lord and go feel again. That's my dream. But you know what? We cannot achieve something on somebody else's premise. Did that dream start today? No. I always dream my wife is there and everybody knows me up close. If I have the mean up I hold nothing back as far as my God is concerned. It's a long, long health dream. Started way up there with only 380 or 400 people where 90% or 60% of those, I don't know what the numbers were, were students. We dreamed. We launched. I had the courage to see the landlord and I go, can you buy your property? And of course, you know, he, he was quite a character. He goes, Pastor, do you have the money? I go, I, I might not have, but I have a God who have the money. And I still remember the place we were talking that, that side. And he goes, listen, I'm a practical guy. You go find for me one million dollar, I'll give you this thing. That started the project. And in five years, with a church that is in excess of 60% of students, with less than 700 uh, in membership or 400, I don't know what the numbers were. I, I, I don't remember very well. We managed to raise 5 million. Did you buy the property? Not yet. Did you start a conversation? Oh, yes. Those people who gave the first contribution, are they still around? Not most of them. Probably, you know, the unmovable object like Mama Albertin and, <laughs> and, and many of us. But many people have come and gone. That's, that's, the, that's the story of church. But this is the beauty. One of the guys who was still a student doing his final year, who gave his money to the building project, is the first black guy who was under my ministry that I knew, who just bought a private jet in this land. Because every work you do for the Lord is never, ever, Ever, ever forgotten. Never. That doesn't happen. So therefore, the biggest battle in life is the devil to dingle to you what doesn't work, not vis-a-vis -vis God, but vis-a-vis -vis people. Gillen preached a message, jazz of clays, where God contains his glory. And his, 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 his thesis is this. If you confuse the weakness of the vessel, with the wealth worth of the con content, you will miss what God has for you. Amen. We have the Michelles and the Henrys and, 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 and rappers and uh, God's power in, in the elder board. Listen, things can go wrong and can go wrong big time. But you know what? I have to rise above the pettiness of what doesn't work because what is at stake for your glory and do anything? I could let my childish nature to jump on me and come in this congregation, meeting after meeting, cycling, you know, having behavior that are not acceptable for you to see that I'm hurt. That doesn't work. God didn't hurt me. People hurt me. So therefore, let me worship God the best I can. When I finish worshiping God the best, I can deal with the hurt. 
we can withhold the best we can give to God for many reasons. One, the atmosphere, you know, they've made me angry. Two, I'm just here to study and go. Now, if people who study the first year at UCT, UWC, uh, CPUT, any other institution of island thought, we should not invest much in this because we're going, you will not have a university. You have to think beyond you for you to give now. Not for your sake, but for the sake of the kingdom. If you don't think beyond you, you will always give less to God. Let me push something here. Let's use just mama and myself to avoid using other people's examples in the church. It's a sensitive environment. We have been involved in many projects, many over the years. And those projects required a few millions. Millions, it's, it's a lot in any language. English or Zulu, million is million. <laughs> so, and it's just two people. Let me throw maybe some of them. One, we dreamt to put our children through to school and give them the best education possible and give them a chance to study in the best schools in town. With best schools comes money. And guess what? We managed to pay for all four of them year in and year out from kindergarten to primary school to high school to university and they've gone to study, you know, the master's program and stuff. That's money. Quantified in millions. For what vision? We don't want our children to start life owing anything to anybody. Because that's the biggest lesson we teach in our family. Don't borrow. Now we had to preach. We had project of properties, project of cars, project of this. All this cost money. Two people managed to put so much in these things. It's not only our story. It's the story of most of us. You have properties, you have cars, you have clothes, you have shoes. And on top of it, we have cosmetic expenses. Cosmetic expenses is not what women put on. It's what you really don't need. <laughs> like going on vacation with the whole family. Those are expensive stuff. A family of four, you, your wife, and two kids, to go anywhere, spend, you have to look at minimum 70 bobs that you have to release. We do it with joy. Let's bring it to church. Why do you think church work is stuck? Because we cannot spend at the level we spend on self. Let's take a minimal vacation. Don't go to the car. It's too expensive. Be conservative with your vacation of two plus two children, four. You're looking at 50,000, you know, for you to enjoy a two weeks vacation or three weeks or whatever. I'm, I'm very, very cheap. You know, you eat uh, popcorns every day and drink <laughs> Kool-Aid, nothing else, nothing major. You don't see stuff. You do this kind of stuff, 50. Now, if you do so, and you take 2,000 people times 50,000, it gives you what? People who went to school. <laughs> 50,000 times 2,000. A million. Okay? 100 million. People are saying 1 million, think again. One hundred million rand. Potentially, it's doable right here. And this property, if we have to rely on the last price, officially we defend it's thirty million. So, which means we can buy three of these, or buy this, break everything down, renovate. But why is it not working? Because of what the sons of the prophet are teaching us today. The first principle of any change is this. Read it until you go to the grave. Desire drives change. 
Anybody who have achieved anything worthwhile from doctoral degree, PhD, anything else, it's because you wanted. You take Edward Dozier. He will tell you, when you do the PhD program, the closest friend you have is the word quit. It's there. He will tell you. Any day you are tempted to quit. And the reason why people don't quit and go to finish and the reason we celebrate at this level because it takes desire. We can change the script if we want to. And that has liberated my mind. That I don't want to sit in a meeting with people who put too much emphasis on resource before we check the state of our heart. Because where there's love, nothing is expensive. And where there's no love, everything is debatable. Thank you for that week, amen. At least it's good to keep me going. Let me take you into some deep thoughts I had. Because the sons of the prophets, as I told you, they, they could think, listen, I'm here only for six months training. Why should I break my back for six months? Let's just be comfortable, do the study, go. The issue of the, of the school is not ours, but not that crop of students. They said, yes, if we were cramped, the next generation should never be cramped. Probably let me throw this. It, it, it will teach something. We have a friend in the United States. Uh, he pastored the church in a very, very, very difficult, very super, you know, we went with you so many times. Difficult. And uh, he felt it's time to leave and move on, came to go plant another church because the church planter. But he had something in mind. I don't want to let the next pastor go through what I went through. I will fight tooth and nail, if need be, to be in bad relationship with these leaders to make sure that the next pastor doesn't suffer. But he doesn't tell anybody anything, only his wife. He pushes, number one, for a decent office. Office, that office. <laughs> you have never seen demons in church. Office. It's okay to have a social thing. Office for the pastor? You can have a list of why we don't need this. The pastor doesn't need all this. He's a man of God. Because he's a man of God, put him in a chicken cook. <laughs> ah, thank God for the verse. Do unto others. If you were a pastor, will you appreciate? But let's leave it. Uh, it's a testimony. But the pastor knew what he was he, he's pushing, and then this elder particularly became demonized. He pushed, and he said stuff. And I attended one of those, some of those meetings. He's saying things that you cannot even handle. But the pastor knew he's just pushing, pushing, and then eventually sanity prevailed. The offices established, you know, decent stuff, shelf, books, and all things, you know, paraphernalia. It looked like cosmetic, but it's... It's decent. You have to work in a good condition. Now he goes to the bigger project, salary. <laughs> He's pushing for some salary. Even myself, I was quiet, but in my heart, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> but he's pushing for this thing. He's pushing, and then there's tension and stuff, and, you know, a couple of people left the leadership and left even the church altogether. And then this guy is around, and he's, he's the troublemaker. When he's achieved what he dreamed to do, he called the meeting. He said, listen, my time is in this church is up. I didn't want the next guy to go through what I went through. I wasn't, I, I didn't need it. Uh, I didn't do my studies to, for this. You know, I work as a top guy at the bank, but it was for the next guy to not have a decent salary, to not have a place to stay, and to not have a decent office. And I prayed and the Lord said, you are the next pastor. <laughs> the very guy who insulted and dead stuff is a pastor to this day in that church. Come on, this is a place to applaud. 
Uh, the way you're applauding reminds me of the late Pastor Lucas. I said, if someone doesn't like it, he goes there. <laughs> it's okay, I can end any sort of applause. But the point I'm trying to drive to the church today, it's never about this. It's always about we want. We can't is a lame excuse because I've just proven that personally. People have achieved at the personal level way much more than at the global level. And we are much more than alone. If there's no desire, any little thing becomes too much. The reason the sons of prophets achieved what they did is because they wanted to. Number two, we want. When you want something beautiful happen, you move to we can. When you want, you can. There's a guy in South Africa, he's, he's, he's a comedian, very, very popular. His mother resigned from work where she was working for years and years and put herself back to university. After the guy is so popular, she just finished her honors degree. She goes, since I've gone back to study anyway, almost 60, let me tackle now master's degree. She's studying a master's program. You look at the son, it's like the, the, the father to the mother. And she has even bigger project that when the master's finished, she will take doctoral pro program. Because if you want, you can. Tell your neighbor, never. Your issue is never about means. It's about attitude. We can pull this thing off quickly and be shocked about what can happen. Why? Pauline Kerr helped us. You know, this is a very, very popular saying, but you didn't know who wrote it. Now you know. This is what she said. Where there's a will, there's a way. Every time you want, you will find the way. Just on a light note, because, you know, uh, Tonto Pascal is very, very well dressed. I needed to pick up on him. Pascal wanted a wife. But the wife he wanted was calling him Tonto Pascal. <laughs> now, how do you marry a niece? <laughs> But he understood, when there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> so, the first thing to do is to stop this girl from up calling me Tonto. <laughs> tonto means uncle. So listen, technically, I'm not your uncle, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, poor girl, she was so young, she didn't know where the refusal of Tonto was taking her. <laughs> so just once he killed the Tonto thing, the highway is open. <laughs> Come on, tell your neighbor, neighbor, yeah. where there's a will, there's, there's, a, there's, a, way. there's a way. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. We, can do it. we can do it. If you want to. <laughs> now, the second question is this. Because we live in a very big congregation with all sorts of people, what do we do if some people don't want? Should we stop the project because they don't want? We just work with those who want. Our team leader will come up shortly to explain to us the progress. I was humbled and led to tears. As mama gives him the report, you know, there was an invite that was yesterday and then for reasons, good reasons, you know, many, many people didn't make it to uh, to the breakfast they put together as a committee. And uh, only 20 people showed up. Now with these kind of numbers, you know, the devil can start playing in your minds. He's got for this and against and stuff. But you know what? That fundraise with a handful of men have produced 625,000 rand. That's the power of willingness. 
and I sat in my lounge and think, if these few people can produce at that level, all we need is to multiply the number of willing people for the unthinkable to happen. Some of you are not used to zeros. 30 might sound very, very daunting. But let me calm your heart. There's a church in Johannesburg that wanted to raise money for social projects, not to build the church. If you go to the church, it's just wow. You know, one day I'm going, <laughs> beautiful. But they wanted to be a relevant church, do something for community. And the problem with that church is 60% or more are just blacks, regular guys like us. So you will think, okay, why it's the, the money? But just people like us. And uh, they launched the project for one Sunday. They had to think about our brothers who are worse off than us. Guess what? In one Sunday, they raised 30 million. Oh, yes. Mama, say it again for these unbelievers. <laughs> Please, don't let me down. I'm, I'm excited. Oh, no. Let's preach together, my daughter. Say it again. Please, say it for, just for my sake. Can someone bold say what she said? You. you. <laughs> we can make God say the same thing about Rama. You. They've just done it. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. As the story of the sons of prophets, they've come to understand a simple principle. Desire drives change. If you want, we can achieve anything. So let me run quickly in one or two minutes on the second leg, second principle that you have to embrace in this. You know, we, we wrote building project launch, but pro the right word should be relaunch, as Yokai said, because the project that started uh, 11 years ago, we went for five years and then it died over six years. So we are just resuscitating it now because of the difficulties that are well documented. And the money that people gave has never disappeared. We explained to you about the two million that were used to refurbish this place and then pay the legal things that, you know, just all sorts of stuff. The money is still lying in a bank account as it was. So, with us at the help, your money is safe. We are principled people. There are things that require diligence. Number one, it's when you incur significant losses. Diligence simply means putting effort consistently until you get the desired result. The trouble is when you get losses that are significant, how do you keep going? The year before, not this, the past, the other year, two years ago. No, no, last year. Actually, no, no, the year before last. I don't know when I said it. Uh, I spoke about setbacks and standstill last year. It was to respond to these issues. That the things beyond your control, when they happen, if you're not careful, they paralyze you for the rest of your life. Some of you are in this church. You never serve again because you had a bad experience, either from the church where you came from or in this same church, and something has gone wrong, and you decide, I will never do anything anymore. But you are not punishing the person who did wrong to you. You are punishing the one who you are singing to for your glory, I'll do anything. You be careful when something bad happens like the one that happened to us. All you have is reputation. We went to see our father and mother, you know, Walter and, 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 and Colleen. He repeated the same thing that they've been repeating to us. You have only one reputation. Once it's gone, it's gone. These are the people who are celebrating six years of marriage. We sat, the four of us, talking, and said, only one reputation to protect. Now, the damage that was created at Rama, it's not a small damage. It was at the level of destroying the reputation of the entire church. In the process, 
when the reputation is damaged, all sort of things, and then the one who's in a crossfire is the captain of the ship, you do what? You take a life vest, you jump board. And 600 of our fine brothers and sisters jumped boards. You know, they're not bad people. They just wanted to protect themselves in case it's real that the bishop is a witch. <laughs> so, I, I understand. I don't hold grudge against anybody. You know, so bless the souls. Now, when 600 people leave, and these are not students to come and go, these are working people established with families, that's a big hole in men's power. That's a big hole in terms of financial resource. That's a big hole in terms of project attainment. I guess we were right to not just rush into let's push anywhere. We needed to recalibrate so that I keep my own sanity in the process. It's just a pity it took too long for me to keep my sanity. Uh, but eventually it came back. Those are the six years. Nehemiah went through it with his buddies. Zerubbabel went through it uh, between uh, the last in Matthew. There's a sick 400 years where God went quiet. So even God, when he had some setbacks, he stood still. <laughs> Tell your neighbor it's okay. The problem is to stand still permanently. So that's what today we are going, the standing still is over. We're getting back to work. We're getting back to work. We will do what God has told us to do. We will achieve what we have to achieve. And the 25 people or so who showed up yesterday have proven that where there's a will, there's a way. Because if 625,000 can be collected, any other money can be collected too. We will work with those who are willing. The thing that one has to know for you to be diligent, you have to be sensitive to the fact. What do I mean by that? For the sake of time, let me read some excerpts that are pulled from the teaching I gave about setbacks and, and standstill. One of those that I said is, Setbacks should never lead to permanent standstills. Secondly, I said, nothing of eternal value that is attempted for God will go unchallenged. And rarely the enemy will leave any tactic and explode in order to disrupt the work. Anything, division among us, breaking of relationship, all that stuff is the devil's strategy so that the work is stopped. I was telling my leaders, as long as he's the church member, there's nothing major. When he touches the core of the church, he has put the church down. And to my shame, I have to stand today and admit before you, he did it. He managed to. Things that have never happened in years and years in this life of the ministry. We went through thick and thin, but when you come to the core and the heart of the church, nothing penetrated. He did. I can only take the blame because I'm the captain of the ship. But what do we do? We calibrate and do what you need to do. Another thing I said, the enemy can succeed in delaying the work, not in defeating it. Because it's not my work, it's the work of the Lord. He can delay it, but never, ever defeat the work of the Lord. Never. If God doesn't work with me, he will work with our sons. If he doesn't work with our sons, he will work with our grandchildren, but his project will never die. We thank God that the Patricks and his team have taken up the challenge, roll up their sleeves and say, it is hard, it's tough to go and explain what people have been saying and all this, you know, uh, zings and stuff that were going, the new handles that were going on. We will stand if we need to explain a million times until everybody's on the same page. Thank you so much. And I wrote again. It is so easy to allow a delay beyond your control to become a delay of your own choosing. There are things that happen because you could not control them, but these things are gone. Let's go back to work. And I said lastly, God's blessing on your assignment will not make the work easy to do. 
It has never happened. It's not because it's for the Lord that there will be no challenge. Actually, the opposite is true. The more it is for God, the more you fight. Because there's an enemy who wants to defeat God's purpose. But you ought to arm yourself with faith and perseverance to complete it. How do we finish this? Diligence requires finally seeking God's help. That's how Christians will operate and navigate through this. The first thing we establish a desire to relaunch the building project. But number two, we have to go, hey, we had significant losses. There's nothing we can do. But number two, we know the reason why the fight was at that level is because it's God's work. But three, because it's God's work, let's seek help from God. When we seek help from God, he will recover the stuff that we lost. He will restore the work that was stopped. And he will renew our zeal to do it again. How do I finish this? I finish with one sentence that really blessed me. It's the verse 7. When the Bible says, when Elisha did the miracle, he took a piece of wood, a symbol of the cross of God, of Christ, threw it on the water, this heavy axe head begin to float. Now, Basil, want to think with me. You know, I know most of you are thinkers, you know, that's why you, you are here. <laughs> think with me. If God was able to make the axe head float, do you think the same anointing could make the axe head fly from the water to the dry land? Yeah. Certainly. If God raised Lazarus from the dead after four, four days, do you think God was able to unwrap all the wrappings ar ar around Lazarus? Oh, yes. But God never does a miracle by himself. He does 99,9% .9 of the miracle and the 0,0,1% he asks you to do. In verse 7, all he said, pick it up. You could not retrieve it, you could not do anything, but when I did what you could not do, do what you can do. Stretch your hands, bring it back. That's all. That's all. That's all God is asking us to do. Stretch your hand and retrieve it. You could never bring Lazarus from the dead that brought him, but you can at least unwrap him. Lose that man, let him go. How do we finish this teaching? And then we call the team to come up. This is how we finish. God will do the part only he can do. But you will leave to us the part we can do. Patrick, over to you. Thank you so much. Let's receive Patrick. God bless you. Come on, you can do better. Come on, you can do much better than that. Thank you, sir. So, listen, listen. I know if you have to, but don't rush out. You know, you can go.